Why, hello, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, reacting to some hirings for the bench coach and batting coach positions that the Padres just made and what they say about the franchise going forward, and I think it's a good thing. Looking at, you know, maybe maybe uh, temper your expectations, Padres fans, for what starting pitching uh, type of players that the Padres are going to go after this offseason, why to keep your uh, expectations in check, and then reacting to the big Wander Franco extension uh, in any way that I can and kind of comparing it to Tatis is just a tiny little bit. I don't know, maybe a little bit. And also Thanksgiving Eve. So it's an exciting time, guys. Locked on Padres. You know what it is. Here we go. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday, November 24th, Thanksgiving Eve, and in my opinion, a very underrated mini sub-holiday, dare I say, and I... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host with sometimes, occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can find me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. I've written for Baseball FYI, Friars on Base, Off Bench Baseball, or Just Baseball. I'm a staff writer there, so you can follow me there on Twitter. And you can follow the Twitter account for the show, which is at LO underscore Padres. If you see me pointing right now, it means that you're watching the YouTube. You can check out the YouTube, Locked On Padres on on YouTube for all my link to that in the description of the podcast. And for today's show, guys, I think we got a good one. I really do. Today's show, of course, as always, thank you for making Lockdown Potters your hashtag first listen every day. Every day, We are free and available on all platforms. For today's show, a fun little one, a fun little, uh, little, little teaser. Not, not a teaser. What's the word for like, the, not the calm before the storm, but like something that keeps you occupied. An appetizer. There we go. Uh, a good appetizer for what I think is going to be an ep- excellent episode tomorrow and a fun episode on Friday. But um, for today's episode, reacting to the news that the Padres are hiring a couple uh, interesting guys for their coaching staff. Um, Ryan Christensen uh, for the bench coach spot. And then, what's his name? Let me make sure I get this right. Michael Bradar. Hopefully I said that right, as their next hitting coach. Um, two interesting signs of what they exactly mean for the Padres. Going to get into that first. Then going to talk about, uh, via The Athletic, uh, beat writer for the Padres, Dennis Lynn, did a little mailbag talking about um, the the Padres, kind of what they might be going for, answering some questions as in regards to C.J. Abrams' kind of availability um, and whether or not he'll debut next year and who they may be going after in free agency with there being so many big free agents starting this offseason. So many free agents in general, as we've discussed ad nauseum in the past like week or two. Uh, we've talked about the free agency breakdown, but a lot of stuff to talk over there. And then talking about Juan Franco's contract and comparing it to Fernando Tatis Jr.'s contract. Uh, historic extension for my guy there. And then just uh, just talk a little Thanksgiving uh, chatter before we kind of wind things down. I hope you guys are all having a decent time during this holiday season. Let's get into it, everybody. Let's talk about it. Okay, so first of all, the, the lesser... The one that I think that needs to be talked about first between the two hirings is Mr. Christensen. He is from the Oakland A's. They just, uh, via Ken Rosenthal, granted permission for the Pirates to interview bench coach Ryan Christensen for the same position in San Diego, sources tell The Athletic. Christensen worked under new Padres manager Bob Melvin in Oakland. That's the biggest thing there. He worked under Mr. Bobby. He worked under Bobby. So as far as I'm concerned, he can get whatever guy he wants. That's cool. That's cool. I don't really know exactly what Ryan Christensen will bring to the table. It's really hard oftentimes to um, exactly decide. This isn't like the the NFL. I think the NFL you can actually see and look up and study a little bit more of the schemes that coaches bring to the table, like what they actually do as head coaches. But for baseball especially, it's a little bit hard to dig deep into what exactly they do aside from being – just looking at their resume, looking how they're doing. And this guy worked with Bob Melvin, and Bob Melvin is considered one of the best managers in baseball. Um, a lot of people have said, well, his playoff record isn't great. To that I say, well, he has a team that's as much as the Padres before. So I like that. I, I think that that's, if that's the big criticism against this guy, then I'm feeling pretty open. I'm adjusting in my seat right now. I'm feeling all feeling all uncomfortable. Let me get comfortable for a second, guys. I have, I have a weird outfit on yet again if you guys want to check out on YouTube. I got the straw hat as usual, but then I have I Love You 3000 for shout out to my Avengers Endgame homies. Um, 
So I, I like the hiring. That's that's a nice step in the right direction for sure. I really like the way the Padres mentioned that they're moving in general. We'll talk about that in a second. The next person that they're expected to hire is Michael Berdar, and he's 27 years old as next hitting coach. Now reading from The Athletic, um, Berdar, considered by some to be a rising star in the coaching industry, will be the Padres' eighth hitting coach in nine years. He replaces Damian Easley, who spent a decade in a Padres organization that has undergone frequent instructor turnover. Easley, the lead hitting instructor from 2020 to 2021, is expected to join the Diamondbacks as their assistant hitting coach, according to Sorsen. Some- San Diego still must name at least a third base coach, a first base coach, and a catching instructor. None of the incumbents in those roles, Bobby Dickerson, Wayne Kirby, and Rod Barajas, are expected to return. Dickerson already has taken a job as the Phillies' infield coach. A full Padres staff could be announced by the end of next week. Um, look, it's, it's very interesting. The piece also notes, uh, Dennis Lynn notes that he went to Michigan and he played with Jake Cronenworth, which is really, really cool. I love, love that. Love to have some continuity there. Um, you already saw that the Padres made moves like this when they hired certain like fielding coaches and whatnot that worked with Manny Machado in Baltimore. In my opinion, that's a, that's a good step. And what both of these hirings say is while I'm not necessarily guaranteeing that they will work and that these guys will be excellent and that this won't be another thing that becomes trendy on Twitter and that we're not going to be slandering, uh, Bobby. Uh, what's his name Larry Rothschild who was just getting absolutely just cooked alive he was fighting for his life on on um, on Padres Twitter not literally he wasn't on Twitter all that much for what I understand but um I don't know exactly how it'll work but I do like that unlike some other teams you know what I mean you look at other teams and sports right now the Mets this morning actually making waves yet again because Steve Cohen is weird and is just just a mad tweeter of insanity. Um, and, you know, you don't have this same feeling of like, they're adjusting to what happened last year. And I think that that's a good sign. I think it's a good sign that they're adjusting and they're going for people that have great resumes. Even if it doesn't work, you can't say that you knew this wasn't going to work. You could have said that for Jace Tingler. You could have been like, all right, this guy barely has an experience and he's just like a, another arm extension of AJ Preller. With Bob Melvin, you can't really say that. Bob Melvin's his own kind of guy and he managed in Oakland and did great and he's bringing in his own people. Then they're hiring Young and they're hiring someone from the San Francisco Giants for anybody who's unfamiliar. The San Francisco Giants have been killing it, especially in the hitting department over the past few years. Obviously pitching, they've been killing it too. They've been, you know, increasing value for a lot of guys, Anthony Discafani being one, Kevin Gosman being the poster boy for just a guy who signs like a one-year $8 million deal and then all of a sudden might be a big top free agent acquisition for this offseason for a deal worth more than $100 million. Like The Giants have shown that they know how to get the best out of their players, so I like that they're hiring somebody young that it's just a, it's just a, it's just a batting coach, you know what I mean? It's not like this is the end of the world, but I like that there's a connection with Jake Cronenworth, and I just like that this shows that the Padres are looking at their team and saying, you know what, we're adjusting, we know we were terrible terrible last year and we're not just hiring people who are extensions of Preller. You got Ruben Nieba from Cleveland. That's a big ad. It's a few weeks ago about that big ad over the host of Lockdown Guardians. He talked about how everybody loves this guy and you look at all the people that the, the Indians have turned out, excuse me, that the Guardians have turned out, the Cleveland baseball team has turned out over the few years. And a lot of credit of that goes to Ruben Niebla being able to maximize the potential of players. Obviously, you got to draft well and whatnot, and obviously the guys just have to perform well, but a lot of scouting does go into this when it comes to people on your staff. So I think that that is an often very underrated part of this. The Padres are not the Rockies, man, and I have complained before. I didn't defend Jace Tingler exclusively, but my take was kind of, let's calm down a little bit. I wasn't going to be thrilled. The only reason I wasn't going to be thrilled is because Jace Tingler... Oftentimes when people, I mean, I just mentioned that the ninth hitting coach uh, over the last decade for the Padres, oftentimes it's not a good sign that you're firing people over and over. It's just not. Usually if you're firing a couple people a decade, okay, maybe those guys are just bad candidates, which still falls on you a little bit as an owner or as a manager or GM, whatever. But when it's over and over, that becomes an organizational thing. As far as I'm concerned, if you want to go ask the New York Knicks, if they were, I mean, I know they're good now, but like for the past like 25 years, that's on um, their ownership and their management. It's not just that they happen to sign the worst draft picks and it's no, it's a lot of organizational things. So the way I see this is this is a good step in the right direction for the Padres. I like that they're hiring interesting people for these roles and people who have a good resume outside of San Diego and that they're not just newbies. And don't get me wrong, newbies can lead to greatness. 
Everybody always talks about Bill Belichick and how he came from the Cleveland Browns for my NFL heads out there. But I do like that it is a sign that the Padres are heading in the right direction. I think that this is a really good hire. I like both of them. I love the Bob Melvin hire. I adored the Ruben Yable hire. And it's really exciting. We're probably going to get more news by the end of the week. Um, I don't know, man. I just I think this is really cool. I think that it's a sign that that they care. And this is a sign that athletic piece about AJ Prowler talking about his tendencies that maybe he's starting to bring in people that think differently from him. That's how I view it. Maybe you guys feel differently. Feel free to comment or send me some stuff on Twitter. Now, before we get into the rest of stuff, I also want to talk about something else that makes me very, very happy. That is, of course, Thanksgiving, guys. I adore Thanksgiving. It is so much fun, and I love all the good food and treats that you get. But maybe you want to take it a little bit easy. I mean, my gut is getting out there. Let me tell you guys, it's 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 getting a little bit out there. It's it, I've actually been working out a little bit, but nonetheless, if you want to save on those some of those calories, you should check out Built Bars, guys. The best protein bars in all the land, not just San Diego, not just Cleveland, not just San Francisco, everywhere in all the land. Feast on something delicious and feel good about it. One slice of pie has upwards of 300 calories, and that's on the low end. Most Built Bars are only 130 calories and only four grams of sugar with plenty of protein. It's awesome, low calorie, Low carb, low fat, high protein, and best of all, my favorite part, great variety of flavors, man. They've got caramel, brownie delight. They've got cherry barcia, my mom's personal favorite. Coconut brownie chunk, a favorite of the Lockdown crew. All sorts of flavors, raspberry, chocolate, double chocolate, caramel brownie, all sorts of stuff. Whatever you're in the mood for, they taste good and they're healthy for you guys. So what are you waiting for? Go! to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Remember that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Woo, all right. Mm. Of course, thank you everybody for making Lockdown Padres your hashtag first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. And now let's transition to the next sort of thing, the highlight of today's episode dare I say, is talking a little bit about starting pitching. And I want to react to a question that was posed to Mr. Dennis Lynn of The Athletic, a man who I've invited uses to accept my invite. Nah, that guy's super busy. What can I say? I just, hey, look, I try and the podcast, guys, but look, sometimes I can't get the A-listers. What do you want from me? I'm trying my best out here. But anyway, guys, uh, a question was posed to Dennis Lynn in The uh, Athletic, and he did a little mailbag, answered a couple of questions. And one of them is the most important, which is about starting pitching. Person asked, other than Marcus Stroman, who are starting pitchers the Padres would realistically target via free agency? And how likely would it be for the Padres to consider signing someone who receives a qualifying offer given they lose their second and fifth highest draft selections and one million from their international bonus pool? Says someone. Um, look, and, and Dennis Lynn, he basically mentions that, uh, Stroman is attracted to teams in part because he was not eligible for a qualifying offer and thus would not require draft pick compensation. Others include Matt Scherzer, Kevin Gosman, Zach Greinke, Alex Cobb, and Taylor Anderson. Those who were eligible but did not receive a qualifying offer include Clayton Kershaw, Carlos Rodon, John Gray, Anthony Descafani, Alex Wood, and Stephen Matz. The latter three of those all just signed Stephen Matz last night to the Cardinals on a deal that a lot of people thought was a little bit of an overpay, but hey, as far as I'm concerned, I, I got to see it to believe it. If the Cardinals go after somebody, they're a first-class organization, then I have to believe that it might be a good move until proven otherwise. Is that a little bit of a basic casual sort of answer on my part? Sure, but what? Sue me. Um, and then Dennis Lynn also goes to note that um, paying the additional costs on top of a nine-figure contract for American League Cy Young winner Robbie Ray would be a surprise. And what would happen is if they did get Robbie Ray, there would be a pick thrown in there. And he notes, you might not be all that freaking out about these these compensation packs are right now. Consider this. The second and fifth highest selections in recent Padres drafts include Luis Campizano, Matt Brash, Dylan Coleman, Xavier Edwards, and Joshua Mears. Not necessarily big, big names, but Luis Campizano, you've heard of him before, potential future star offensive catcher for the Padres, maybe if everything goes right. And then also uh, Xavier Edwards was involved in the trade that got us Jake Cronenworth. So he definitely had value. He's like a top 100, top 80 prospect for the Rays currently in baseball. Not in their farm system, but in all of baseball. So that's a decent prospect there. But basically... Uh, yeah, I think that we need to temper expectations for who the Padres can exactly sign this offseason. I've mentioned a bunch of them in the free agency preview. You guys can go check out more thoughts on that. But I just think that when you look at it, it comes down to this. The Padres' projected payoff, their projected payroll, not payoff, for 2022 
is already approaching 190 million. I've said this on the show before, unless they're able to somehow miraculously dump the first baseman that they have, who we are going to be talking about more in depth on Friday, by the way, uh, kind of talking about what a potential trade could potentially even look like um, involving the guy at first base, um, that if you aren't able to get rid of that contract, there's just something about that 190 million salary, which is a lot. I think people are really forgetting sometimes. This is so much money for Padre standards. For Yankee standards, it's like, oh my God, you're being cheap. But for Padre standards, historically, this is a lot of money committed. And it's not like all the money that's being thrown right now has been a hit. So I wonder, while ownership has been patient in the Sidlers and everybody, um, and AJ Peller has been great too um, in this respect, but I wonder if you keep set showing that the biggest money values are obviously Tatis and obviously Manny Machado has been great, but then if you have big misses like the guy at first base, like Will Myers, like the fact that you Darvish fell apart, Blake Snell was looking a little iffy, you've got all these different players. You're going to have Mike Clevenger making more money next year. That was part of their deal that they had uh, to kind of smooth over his rehabilitation process. He wasn't getting paid as much um, last year. This year he will be. If you take all that into account, even guys like Drew Pomeranz getting a decent, hefty contract in the bullpen, um, you look at all that stuff and you say, I don't really think that the Pirates are going to be able to give that giant, you know, super duper contract. I think it's going to be really, really difficult. A nine figure contract. Now, if you're able to dump the first baseman, maybe something starts to come into play. Maybe you have an extra like 20 million to deal with. And if you do, I still don't know if you want to do bank it all in on one starter, especially a Robbie Ray type. I actually haven't heard many of my listeners and many Padres fans necessarily clamoring for Robbie Ray. I've heard a little bit more about Marcus Stroman. I've heard a little bit more about um, uh, Max Scherzer for obvious reasons, although I don't see that. I think he's going to resign with the Dodgers personally. Um, I've heard a little bit about that when it comes to Carlos Rodon. Um, Carlos Rodon is interesting. But with the health concerns, I've mentioned that that scares me a little bit. Do we want to be paying a premium on a short deal, a short deal premium, granted, which is something that should be accounted into this, for a guy like Rodon when we already have so many health questions with the fact that Mike Clevenger, who should be ready for spring training, is dealing with uh, coming off of Tommy John surgery. You've got Denelson Lament in his situation. You had Chris Paddock getting banged up. And while it's not entirely injury-based, uh, Mackenzie Gore, who was added to the 40-man roster, like, that's a guy that's just been through the ringer when it comes to being a, a developing prospect. Hopefully, Ruben Niebla can do better with him, but that's kind of how I'm feeling. And some of my favorite uh, additions that the Padres can make, Tyler Anderson, Alex Cobb, John Gray, um, those guys, Alex Wood, unfortunately, and Anthony Discafani and Steven Matz all just re-signed, or not re-signed. In the case of Alex Wood and Anthony Discafani, they did, but um, Steven Matz went to the Cardinals. Those, those guys I kind of liked as potential fifth starters and that's basically what Dennis Lynn said they need to go get some some starting pitching but I don't know if, if expecting because of the Darvish stuff uh all these contracts I don't think they're giving another one and I actually don't think they should I think Robbie Ray there's a future uh scenario in which he ends up being a big trap for a lot of teams I know he increased a lot over this past season but I don't like that it's basically just two seasons if we're going to give crap to Trevor Bauer for his season last year and how he got a mega contract I'm just a little bit afraid to give that to Robbie Ray if I'm another team because I could see it going bad it's not worth the amount that he's getting maybe he's going to be like a, a Hyunjin Ryu type starter that's not bad don't get me wrong but is that the way to go for a guy it's not like this guy has been doing it even doing uh decent numbers for a while like let's say you know who's a good example like Kyle Hendricks Kyle Hendrick, you, Hendricks aside from this year you would have paid a premium for because while his stats weren't incredible you would pay the higher salary potentially because he was consistent every year with his numbers having a low three ERA maybe not getting that many strikeouts but maybe just not allowing a lot of runs fundamentally kind of like Marcus Stroman light in a lot of ways so I think that's how the Potters should look at this he also mentions the penalties will be a significant consideration if Sandy were to pursue, say, outfielder Nick Castellanos. Like Ray, Castellanos divine, declined a qualifying offer. That is true. I think that the Padres are looking into adding a nice power bat for their lineup who doesn't murder them defensively. Castellanos will kill you defensively. But if they do add the DH, I would like that. Or guys like Avicelio Garcia or Michael Conforto, I would love. I think Conforto could be a real, real cheap option, especially potentially on a one-year deal for this team, uh, I think could be really, really great. So I think that's where the Pirates should be looking. There's a lot of interesting moves, but guys, like, let me emphasize, if the Padres don't get that giant starting pitcher, it's okay. They don't have to make blockbuster deals. A lot of things went wrong. A lot of things, almost too many things went wrong for the Padres. 
And what we just saw in the World Series run with the Braves is that taking these low-cost type of gambits could pay dividends when you have depth and can make up for kind of your big guys not necessarily performing as much as you might want them to, like a Grisham, like a Udarvish and Blake Snell until the last month for Blake Snell. So in my opinion, you're looking at someone like Tyler Anderson. Give me an Alex Cobb. Give me a Tyler Anderson. Alex Wood was going to be on my... I haven't compiled my official uh, free agency wish list. I want to wait a little bit more until we get into a little bit more of the holiday kind of Christmas season. So maybe sometime next week we'll try and do that. But uh, Alex Wood was going to be on that. I really liked Alex Wood, and I think he had high potential, but unfortunately, he ain't on the board anymore. Uh, Disco Fani, I thought, was going to cost a little too much, but anyway, that's kind of my thoughts on that. I think that Padres fans should still be very, very optimistic and some decent bets this offseason. I don't know which ones. It doesn't have to be Freddie Freeman. I'd love Freddie Freeman, but I'm just saying. It should be pretty good. I, I think it's going to be a really exciting offseason. It's already been an exciting offseason with the managing hires. This is a team that's not looking only for the home run right now, it feels like. They're trying to develop, and they're taking notes from all these other teams that have, quite frankly, built fundamental baseball teams a lot better than they have over the years, even if they've had some nice home runs like Joe Musgrove, Fernando Tatis Jr., and Jake Cronenworth when it comes to just finding the diamonds in the rough and whatnot. Um, but speaking of of finding the diamonds in a rough, everybody. You know what you often have to do when it comes to betting? You have to find the odds that are, you know, not being talked about as much as other people. That's right. It's Thanksgiving, and we all know that what that means, everybody. Football, and nothing goes better with football than turkey and betting. They have you covered with all the holiday props, maybe the sneaky upsets for tomorrow's games and whatnot. Is your number one sp- Spot for all the sports action this Thanksgiving. Head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus with promo code locked on to receive your bonus. And it's not just football, obviously, guys. They got you covered with pro and college hoops. They've got you covered with the NHL, with the boxing, with the UFC, and of course, baseball. Duh, you're listening to a Padres baseball podcast. Of course, they got you there, guys. You don't want to take wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all of your favorite sports. Bet online, we're stuffed with deals this Thanksgiving. How do you like that? How do you like them apples on that one, guys? Mm. All right. And now for the final segment of today's show, I want to quickly Quickly, uh, which is that uh, in the mailbag from Dennis Lynn, uh, before we talk about C.J. Abrams um, a little bit, who I think is a topic that sometimes people forget. He is a high-level prospect for sure, and he might be debuting next year. Um, I should say, he says, what is the word on CJ Abrams after returning from his injury? Have evaluations changed at all? Or do people still think he can be a star in MLB? When might be he, when might he first appear for the Padres? Most evaluators now speaking from Dennis Lynn still strongly believe in July, a few weeks after broken tibia and sprained MCL ended Abrams' season, Keith Law rated him the number two prospect in baseball. More recently, scouts said Abrams looked quite good returning to action in the Arizona instructional league. And he also mentions that he probably would have made his debut this year if not for the injury which is really exciting everyone that i've talked to really likes cj Abrams as a prospect they say that he's definitely a shortstop type of player dennis lynn brings this up as well that he's definitely more experienced at shortstop he hasn't gotten a lot of real looks in outfield which could be interesting perhaps could he take over from the second baseman spot maybe there's a little bit more platoon going on but the infield is really crowded with the pirates remember you still got guys like jerks and profar and hassan kim who i don't entirely want to give up on Jerkson Pro, I'd be more willing to give up on. I love that guy. But in terms of like the upside, I think, uh, Hassan Kim definitely has a little bit more upside that I'm not ready to totally give up on him, especially because the Pirates owe him a decent amount of money. Um, and with CJ Abrams, like, yeah, the, the DH would really help here. If you add the DH, if you add, add some roster flexibility, this could be interesting. And yeah, maybe Fernando Tatis Jr., depending on how things go, maybe he'll move to the outfield a little bit more often. Maybe he plays a little bit of both. Bottom line, though, is I think that Fernando Tatis Jr., while not the stud defensive player that he was in the 2020s truncated season, 2021, not that awful, not great, but clearly... His defense wasn't bad enough to offset his offense. A guy like, you know, I've talked about Mike Zanino. I've talked about Nick Castellanos. Those guys, sometimes their defense is so bad that it offsets what they do offensively. Um, but not with Tatis. The numbers were just too insane. Josh Nambers of Lockdown Nationals, I've been beefing him with him for months, saying that he'd rather have Trey Turner over Tatis because he's he's good on both sides of the ball. 
oh, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't care, all right? The guy's 22 and he's hitting 40 bombs a year. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> like, it's just, it's, sometimes it's just that simple, guys. Sometimes it's just that simple. But um, that's, in terms of that, again, I will reiterate the same take that I've had for a lot of the offseason. C.J. Abrams, the way he's being evaluated, he could be a really star caliber player for the Padres, a true shortstop, a guy that can give you more power than some people expect, I think. People think he might just be a batting average on base beast, but a little bit more power than people might expect. And on top of that, power to, power to the right side of the field, by the way. Um, and on top of that, he is a super valuable asset, giving up on him guy he also mentions Mackenzie Gore this is going to be a big season for him maybe he debuts but we'll have to see how he does in spring training and the fall leagues and all that stuff uh, I don't or the spring yeah the spring cactus league and all that in El Paso um we'll have to see how he does there um for sure um and I'm nervous the development of Mackenzie Gore scares me um, it's very rare, and I've talked to some prospect people who are telling me, like, it's it's very rare that guys who haven't pitched in Major League action just precipitously just absolutely crash down in prospect rankings. It's not like Gore came up and then got torched for a month and then, you know, fell apart on the prospect rankings. This isn't like a Cal Quantrill when he got a little bit torched when he got up here, or even, dare I say, a Chris Paddock to an extent where he's fallen, by, or Ryan Weathers, right? This isn't that case. This is a case of a guy that's... It's got to be mental at this point. Last thing I wanted to bring up was a giant deal that happened involving Sir Wander Franco of the Bay Rivers. He signed a massive, um, what's it called, extension with the Rays yesterday. Um, 12 years, $223 million extension to stay with the Rays. There are a lot smarter people than me that have been breaking down all this. A lot of people are saying that, you know, this is he's going to be worth more than this in a few years because he's so good and all this stuff. This is the Rays taking advantage of that, blah, 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 blah. The way I view it is I actually think it's a little bit of a win for both. Juan and Franco gets financial security. He doesn't have to worry about anything. He doesn't have to worry about the arbitration process, which is a big um He just gets that security. And by the way, guys, I don't like how confidently everyone's like, you're getting you're getting the best player who's going to be the best player in baseball in a few years for it's, it's like okay so on top of you thinking he'll be the best you think he's going to be best right so that's going to happen and then that means that you're thinking that Raul Acuña Jr who's very young Juan Soto Fernando Tatis Jr Mookie Betts by the way who everybody seems to be forgetting is an incredible player uh um um so a couple other guys like a Trey Turner um uh, Carlos Correa all the all these sorts of players that are out there that all of a sudden it's just so annoying that after 70 games, people are just all in. Best player in baseball. Best player in baseball. It's like, all right, I mean, he might be, like, when you're a guy that's accepting a contract and being offered that much money for what has been 70 games, what if he becomes injury prone? And what if, breaking news, sports fans, sometimes people adjust and might figure out better ways to get out Wander Franco. All this stuff looks great. But maybe what if in year four, he becomes a good shortstop, a really good shortstop? I, I have almost no doubt in my mind that he'll be a good shortstop, but... In my opinion, I compare this to the Tatis deal in the sense that, yes, it's possible that those guys will be worth more when they hit the free agent market, but instead of having to deal with arbitration, and I think that this is what this says a lot about, right? This says a lot about the arbitration system and how weird it is and how players don't want to view it. I think it could be a sign that the Rays know that in the upcoming kind of collective bargaining agreements that um, there might be some changes to be expected when it comes to arbitration because I think the arbitration system is just weird. It is one, one thing I will say that it is good is that he will be 32 by the time this deal is up, that means that he'll be able to cash in again, potentially on maybe a five-year mega deal if he need be, if he would like. Um, so while yes, he could be making money, more money if he waited it out, I do think that I don't like the presumption that this guy is a superstar. And don't get me wrong, I've made a little bit of presumptions myself when it came to Tatis, I get it, but Tatis was hitting for like massive, massive power. Like, literally home run numbers. And on top of that, was a great defensive player that second year. And on top of that, was electric and literally being an exciting player in the sport. And I, if you don't think that the marketability blockbuster value of Tatis played at least some part in his contract extension, I like, he, it had to be. You know what I mean? Everybody knows who Fernando Tatis Jr. is right now. He's one of the, like... Even if the Padres season doesn't go well, uh, if things don't go well, I could still just talk about Tatis every day and be pretty better off than a lot of teams in baseball, including teams that are actually pretty decent, by the way. Like, it's not like the Mariners, who had a great year, have necessarily a household name that everyone's talking about. Everybody loves Tatis. He's the cover of the show and everything. So that 
a little bit into it too. So I just want to warn everybody, oftentimes in baseball, we get obsessed with the stat cast profiles. We look them up. We say he had the hard hit rate. He never strikes out, which, which I did like. I do like the fact that he isn't striking out at all. Wander Franco, that's a really, really good sign um, for sure, especially in the age of power and all that. So will he get better? I think so. I would bet on him being better, but I'm just saying everyone's like, Wander Franco's an idiot. He could have got made more. Well, what if he starts getting banged up? I bet you once upon a time, Troy Tulowitzki, everyone would have been like, yeah, I would have kept him forever. This guy's a Hall of Fame talent. I'm just saying, what if he becomes injury prone? That's what you're thinking if you're Wander Franco and you just figure, I don't want to deal with arbitration stuff. And if you're the Rays, maybe it's a little bit more tradable of a contract potentially if you want to do what the Rays usually do, which is just trade their best players. They love doing it. They love doing it. They do it all the time. They love hitting the hard reset, which isn't good for the sport, by the way. Um, but I do really think that this contract shows you we're heading towards a very interesting collective bargaining agreement, stuff that I'm not smart enough to be able to fully uh, foresee into the future about. But I think we're heading into a very interesting time in which – Hopefully we get the National League DH, the Universal DH. That'll be great. But arbitration, contracts and stuff, front-loading them, the whole the way that um, service time manipulation occurs, maybe that's what Juan Franco wanted to avoid. That's the way that it's kind of similar to Tatis. Unlike the Rays, though, there is no service time manipulation here. The Padres just said, he's ready. Great. We're bringing up Fernando Tatis Jr. We think he could be a star right now. And paid dividends. I think that that had to at least and why they extended um, Tatis so quickly and why he was able to accept that contract so quickly. So that was very exciting. Like, remember when once upon a time that was the biggest question? It was like, like, oh my God, are they done Tatis? So again, guys, I do warn, it is fair to say, 70 games, pump the brakes a little bit. Pump the brakes a little bit. And feel free to cold takes, old takes exposed me, freezing cold takes. If in three years, he's a top five player in baseball and he remains, by the way, he remains a top five player in baseball for a long time. Let's keep that in mind. There are plenty of guys who have been like a top player in base. You remember Carlos Gomez? You remember him? He was pretty good for a couple years and then he fell off. You know what I'm saying? So like there has been plenty of guys who have been the best player in baseball for a few little stretch, but for a sustained amount of time. That's another thing entirely. So maybe this is going to be worth the value. We'll have to see what happens. But either way, very curious to see what happens over these next coming months when it comes to the collective bargaining agreement. Man, I am adjusting my hat a lot today, guys. Um, but yeah, that's basically all my thoughts for today. Look forward to CJ Abrams' debut whenever it happens next year. That's an underrated storyline heading into this next year. Remember, guys, having that roster flexibility is very, very important. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but what if... All of a sudden, you get a lot of injuries. Maybe Jake Cronenworth gets hurt or he, you know, things go downhill. Let me knock on wood real quick. Like, if something like that happens, you feel really good about having that depth, don't you? Or if you're, if you're like, one of the best teams in baseball and you're like, let's go for it now. Let's do it. Then you can trade C.J. Abrams or Gore or Campizana or Hassel for some extra help then when you have a little bit more of a sample size to gauge where your team is at. Boop. But yeah, with that all said, guys, um, in terms of the future of this podcast, before we get into that, though, let me just say this has been your first listen, Lockdown Padres. We're free and available on all platforms, but make your second listen now, Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. That is Locked On Bets. In terms of the future of this, guys, tomorrow we are talking with Ryan Styles of the Locked On Royals and Locked On Thunder podcast for a very special What We're Thankful For Thanksgiving episode. Talking about, in general, things we're thankful for at the end of the episode, but baseball things we're thankful for. Some obvious ones, some not so obvious ones, some incredible hot takes from Rylan regarding stats, um, some funny little takes on my part. Do I bring up the guy from first base and how I'm trying to pawn him off onto the Royals? Maybe I do, just for you guys, because I know you guys can't get enough of that. Um, for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast where you your podcast from Stitcher, Spotify, 
Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Himalaya, Overcast, wherever. And follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. I know the end of this got a little bit weird. God dang it. Uh, but until next time, stay safe and, of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.